Timing charts are the literary form of motion. They're used to plan the chronological and spatial relationships of your drawings before entering the in-between phase. Let's take a closer look at how they work. Be sure to leave me a like and let's get started. Sense Labs tablets manufactured for accurate Pen tracking, the pressure sense and reaction Whenever you're interacting with digital app graphics Reach for the bag that you packed it and make a habit Ready, open the box, anticipation is over Comes with its own OLED backlit controller Magnets to close the stylus and wireless connectivity holder All in one enclosure, anybody can draw Flip the switch and it's on Surface texture is flawless, not to mention responsive Ergonomically formed, tape and rest for your palm Pick the color you want There's two aesthetics to choose from Or try them all Maybe start with a small one Check out the launch They're cooking up something awesome Several raw options Check the link in the box So you can master the process Of your digital art So usually I plot my timing charts Between two keys, two extremes Or a key and an extreme. Basically, you're just traveling from one core drawing to the next, planning out all the spatial relationships of your drawings before in-betweening. In this video, we're going to be using all the animation knowledge we've learned in this course to decipher timing charts and learn to read them. So here we have a diagram of the anatomy of a timing chart. So let's start with the timing of our drawings. Basically, this is just a legend detailing how we're going to label each type of drawing on a timing chart. This F with the hashtag next to it means our frame number. So if our frame number is circled, it's going to be a key. If it has a little power effect around it, it's going to be an extreme. And if it's underlined twice, it's going to be a breakdown. And finally, if the frame number on the chart is alone with no indicators around it, no symbols around it, then it's going to be an in-between. So keys, extremes, and breakdowns are our core drawings. That's what we look for first when we read a timing chart. Moving on, we're gonna learn how we label our spatial relationships on a timing chart. So if we go for half spacing or even spacing, we make two arcs that are equal, somewhat equal in size. So we can see one is probably a keyframe, five is probably a keyframe, and three is right in the middle between one and five. So we just make two equal sized arcs to show that. If you guys don't know what half spacing, thirds, and favors are, check out my video on timing and spacing. Next up, we have spacing on thirds in the middle here. So there's two ways we could do this, one and five being our keyframes. In the first example here, three is closer to one than it is to five. It's one third away from frame one, but two thirds away from frame five. This chart is just telling us that frame three is going to be spaced on thirds, we know that because we have three arcs, and it's going to be closer to one than it is to five. Now we have the opposite example where we have two arcs from one to three and then one arc from three to five. That just means that three is going to be closer to five than it is to one. So anytime you see three arcs like so, we're talking about spacing on thirds. And lastly, we have favors spacing, FV. Sometimes animators will mark in favors like so, where they'll make one big, one small jump and then one huge jump like that to show that three is heavily favoring one over five, but others will just leave it like this where you can just see on the chart that three lands much closer to one, or in this example right here, that it lands much closer to five. There's many ways that animators label keys, extremes, and breakdowns evens, thirds, and favors. This is just one way that you can label them. You can probably come up with your own labelings for your timing charts. The one thing you wanna make sure though is that you have labelings for keys, extremes, breakdowns, and in-betweens, and then also halves, thirds, and favors. So we have our timing labels and our spacing labels. To practice this, let's break down this timing chart. Okay, so on this chart, all the drawings are labeled by the frame number that they fall on. So to start deciphering what this timing chart is telling us, we look for our core drawings. So we know one is circled, that must be a keyframe. 13 is circled, that's also a keyframe. And seven has two underlines. That is a breakdown. Now what's the relationship between one, seven, and 13? Well, we look at these two large arcs we see here, and that looks like looks identical to what we have over here in even spacing. So that means seven is going to be spaced equally between one and 13. It's gonna fall right in the middle. All right, now that we know what the relationships between our core drawings are, we can move on to the in-betweens. So three, five, nine, and 11 are in-betweens. 
And what's the spatial relationship between them? Let's start on the top side from one to seven. We have this second even arc that's going from one to five to seven. So that tells us that five is gonna fall right in the middle between one and seven. And then we have the same thing for three. So between one and five, three is gonna fall right in the middle. Okay, so let's go on the other side from seven to 13. Seven is a breakdown, 13 is a keyframe. So we have this arc going from seven to nine and then to 13. That tells us that nine is going to be right in the middle of seven and 13. You have another equal arc from nine to 11 to 13. So that tells us 11 is going to be right in the center between nine and 13. So overall, the spacing looks like this object is going to speed up and then slow down. We can just call that an ease in and ease out. If you don't know about ease in, ease out, speed up and slow down, check out my video on the four types of movement. And also all these arcs that we identified tell us that the spacing is even across the entire animation. We're not using any thirds or any favors. So the resulting animation from this timing chart can possibly look like this. See that, so we have frame one, we have frame seven, which is right in the center between one and 13, and we have 13 on the other side. And each of them is spaced evenly. Notice how five is right in between one and seven. And then three is also right in the middle of one and five. Everything is spaced evenly. Now the reason I said that our animation can end up looking like this is because timing charts don't specify direction or speed. They only show us the relationship of our drawings relative to one another. That said, our animation could also end up looking like this. This cube on the bottom. The reason is because we still have keyframes on one and on 13, seven is still a breakdown in the middle, and we still end up with an ease in, ease out with even spacing. So guys, that is basically how you read and decipher a timing chart. Check out my Patreon page. This cheat sheet will be available for free over on patreon.com slash noblefrugalstudio. Okay, you know I usually don't like to leave you guys without a demonstration of what we're learning. So let's practice reading timing charts with this example here. So say an animator gives you this chart with these drawings to in between. Let's decipher what this chart is telling us to do and then I'll give you guys one that you can try for your own practice. When reading a timing chart, what do we do first? Well first, as always, we identify the core drawings and their spatial relationship. So 1 and 13 are keyframes and 7 is a breakdown. Now what's the spatial relationship? Well, this outermost arc right here that we see is telling us that seven is closer to 13 than it is to one. See, we have two jumps from one and one jump to 13. Assuming that all those arcs are equal, that means that's telling us that seven is two thirds away from one and only one third away from 13. Basically, seven is a third favoring 13. And the drawings that the animator provided us reflect that. You can definitely see if I turn on this onion skin that seven is favoring 13 via thirds. Okay, so we established our core drawings and we understand their spatial relationship. Let's move on to the in-betweens. So three, five, nine, and 11 are in-betweens. We'll start again at the top from one to seven. So we have five, it looks like five is another third as we see these three jumps again and it's a third favoring one this time because we have one jump from one and then two jumps to seven so it's a third favoring one and then three doesn't have any jumps three looks like it's just favoring one okay so how about on the side from seven to thirteen from seven we have this arc going from seven to nine and then from nine to thirteen but both of the jumps are equal so that means nine is gonna fall in the middle of seven and 13, that's even spacing. And then how about 11? Well, 11 has no jumps, no markings, and it looks like if you were to draw one, it would be it would go from like this and then there. So that seems like a favor to me. It seems like 11 is going to heavily favor 13. Okay, so we identified our core drawings and their spatial relationships, and we identified our in-betweens and their spatial relationships. Now, before we start drawing, we have to identify our drawing order. Which order do we draw 
our in-betweens in. We already have one, seven, and 13 drawn for us by the animator. So starting with this section from one, to seven, which in between do we draw first? To find the answer, we can imagine this sequence if we didn't have seven drawn for us. So imagine we don't have frame seven. Let's actually just delete that for a moment. So without seven, can we draw five, three, or even nine or 11? Well, no, because we know that five is one third away from one and two thirds from seven, but without drawing seven, we have no idea how close to put five to one or five to seven because seven doesn't even exist. So in the same way, we're gonna draw five first. After drawing five, we'll know how close three is favoring one. So we'll draw five first and then we'll draw three. Then on the other side, which one do we draw first? Well, in the same way, we won't know how close 11 is to 13 unless we draw nine first, which is right in the middle of seven and 13. So let's draw nine third and then 11. Okay, let's get in between. Set up my onion skin to show one and seven to draw five. Just by where the frame numbers are landing, you can already tell that we're animating on twos. Since one plus two equals three, three plus two equals five, five, seven, and so on. Each drawing is going to be exposed for two frames. It's gonna be somewhere around here. Okay, now that we have five, put my update my onion skin, we can see that favoring one compared to five would mean we put it really close like here. If we hadn't drawn five first, a favor could be, you know, over here. Could be, it could even be this far out depending on the drawing that comes after it. But now that we have five to reference, we can see that if we wanna really convince the audience that we're favoring, that three is favoring one, you want to put it really, really close, like something like here. All right, now let's draw. Now we have frame nine to draw third. And nine is right in the middle between seven and 13. It's even spacing. So we'll make nine. Oops, I forgot to, I forgot to label number three. There we go. Nine is going to be right in the middle. Now that we've drawn nine, we know how close to put 11 to 13. Nine is right in the middle, so we can really put 11 real close to 13 to sell it as a favor. And as a result, the following timing chart looks something like this. That is how you read a timing chart. Thank you guys so much for watching. The only thing I wanna leave you guys off with, if you'd like to, is you can try deciphering this timing chart right here. You can just use a circle or a square to keep it really, really simple. Um, this is more about understanding timing charts. Um, the drawing stuff can come later. So we have your core drawings, one, nine, and 15. If you guys want a little homework assignment, you can try following this chart to in between this circle. With that said, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this free animation course has been helpful to you and I look forward to exploring more topics about animation and really getting down to the basics of what makes objects move. Special thanks to Sense Labs for sponsoring this video and huge thank you to my patrons. That's all from me guys. I'll see you next time. Peace.